your host, and today my guest is Lewis Marza. Our key topic for today's chat will be the most effective ways to physically develop athletes. And uh, thank you for jumping on, Lewis. Really looking forward to our chat. No, mate, thank you. Excited to be here. You've had plenty of plenty of high quality guests on, so excited to be one of them. Yeah, no, pleasure to have you on, mate. And and yeah, like I mentioned, we're going to talk uh, a little about. Uh, physical development and long-term athlete development, which is some of the work you're doing at Western United. But for those that aren't aware of your work, mate, do you want to give us a bit of a background on um, yeah, what you've done to, to get you to where you are today? Yep. So I started off um, a little while back doing probably what most did, a sport and exercise science degree undergrad. Um, yep. And then from there, did a few different internships. Um and started to dabble in personal training and then uh, getting involved with some local sports clubs, um, mainly in soccer. So MPL, MPL2 was a level back then. Um, and then from there decided that the environment that I was in, um, in soccer, probably wasn't as well-rounded as what you can get in other sports. Um, so decided to take up an, another opportunity uh, as an intern or an S assistant SNC at um, Coburg Footy Club in the VFL. So I spent a bit of time there um, and eventually became a head of SNC there um, where I learned a lot. It was, it was actually um, pretty critical because I was able to work in more of a multidisciplinary team, which I probably wasn't able to get working in the soccer club that I was at. Um, so that was sort of the next step for me. And then um, basically there was a, a new club starting out in the A-League in soccer and I always wanted to go back into soccer. So... Um, I think it was the end of the 2019 VFL season. Uh, Western United was starting their preseason, so brand new A-League club. So I just sort of pestered them and hit them up a little bit until um, till I got a bit of a response and then became their their first intern as an SNC. So I spent a year interning with uh, Western United in the A-League with the A-League squad in their first season um, and then did some work a little bit later after that as um, sort of like a reconditioning rehab SNC coach working with uh, the injured players that were based in Melbourne while the team was off in the in the hub in Sydney uh, finishing off the, the final series um, and yeah from there I guess uh, I had that connection with the club um, and went away for a year did some more stuff in in MPL soccer um, and that was the COVID ravaged year so there wasn't too much going on seasons were cancelled um, and then the start of the next preseason got a call to go back um, to West United and, and run their um, SNC program for their senior academy, which is their under 23 and under 21 squads. So basically, the the reserve team for the A League setup. Oh, very good. And and you mentioned um, yeah, being a pest and, and getting yourself uh, in the environment. Uh, for those listening in that are of that similar mindset, they want to. Um, give themselves the best opportunity to be to work in an elite club or, or be an intern or, or even just to be able to experience a day down there to see what it's like. Perhaps they're studying at the moment. Uh, what do you what do you find is the most effective way? Obviously, you've had some success in doing that, and then even transferring into future roles after internship. Uh, but yeah, perhaps what, how do you get? I guess your foot in the door. Um, I, I guess the the big thing is uh, you just if you don't ask, you sort of don't get. So I think just don't be shy um reach out to people um they'll give you the time of day and, and most people will respond and if they don't it's not a big deal you can you can move on to the next person um but yeah definitely just just try and ask these people because they're they're usually pretty good in in sort of getting back to you and, and sort of even just if it's uh, um i don't know where to start i don't know how to get an internship but i just want to come in and just see how things are, are going how, how they how they work how they're flowing uh, more often than not, yeah, people will be pretty happy to, to come and invite you into the club for a day. So, so just don't be shy. Just ask. Mm -hmm. oh, great advice, mate. And and then what about when you're in? Uh, how do you put your best foot forward to set yourself up for a future role? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one because obviously there's no nothing's guaranteed, right? So you, you do an internship, you're never going to be guaranteed a role. But I think the best thing you can do is um, is maximise that internship and and make the most out of it because um, I've, I've sort of had a few interns of my own. Um, now I'm working in more sort of um, head head roles in clubs and sometimes, yeah, it's it's a stretch between these interns are, are working, they're going to uni and they're trying to do their placement hours and sometimes they don't give that full uh, attention to the internship or to, the, to what they're doing and they don't make the most of it. Um, 
and it sort of just seems like something that they have to do to tick off their hours. So if you are going to do an internship, I think it's really important that you're, you're going in there, uh, trying to make the most of it, trying to ask questions, trying to learn, trying to take initiative, being proactive, um, and then also um, developing those relationships with the people that are around you in the club because uh, we know how how quickly the things can change in sport. So uh, if, you, if you do a really good job with one SNC coach or even, you know, there's an assistant coach or a head coach or someone else involved in the club that um, they just – they move on to a new job. Uh, they might think of you as as their next ideal um, person for the job. So, so yeah, just definitely take take advantage of the the networks and the relationships that you can build within the club, um, and try to put your best foot forward um, and make the most of it while you're there. Yeah, yeah, it's well said, mate. Like you said, nothing's guaranteed. Um, I think that's important as well to touch on that you, your expectation should be that. You know, disappointment if you, if you don't get a role uh, as there's a lot of that's out of your control but um like you mentioned you never know where it might lead not not just into that in that exact club but actually future roles maybe in a couple of years time at that internship you did leads to a, a full-time gig at another another club because people do move around a fair bit uh, in this industry so now well said mate and, and going back to yourself um in terms of influencers or mentors, if you like, I uh, imagine being at a couple of strong clubs in Coburg, West United, there'd be some who who, who sort of um, come front of mind that have influenced your philosophy, if you like. Yeah, there's there's been a lot, actually. I've sort of taken a little bit here and there from everyone, to be honest. Um, I think back from uh, VFL days, Coburg, um, definitely there was, there was two sort of mentors there. We had a sort of set up where it was, uh, there was one strength and power coach and one sort of speed and conditioning coach. So they had sort of their little sort of niche areas that they would focus on. So definitely took a little bit of, um, a little bit of, I guess, information from both of them. That was, um, it was Adam Valley was the conditioning coach at the time. So I think, I think a few people might know him now. He's done a bit of stuff with the AFL umpires as well. Um, Maribyrnong College. Um, and the other one was Alex Rook, who's uh, done a little bit of stuff in rugby uh, and he's now at, ace performance so they're still both um, going strong in the industry and definitely two people that were crucial to my very early stages of um, learning and development um, back when I was at Coburg and then I think um, for me after that it was it was mainly the guys uh, involved in Wesson so uh, the head SNC of the A-League squad and the assistant SNC um, Andrew Rondinelli and Massimo Madoka so both um both have been really, really important. So they're sort of, they were happy to show me the ropes uh, in terms of pro sport and, and allow me to sort of take some ownership of parts of the program, um, which is really, really good for my development. Um, Rondo's got a fair bit of experience in multiple sports. I think he's done uh, some stuff in tennis, rugby, uh, footy as well. He's been sort of all around. And, and Massimo was a, was an ex A-League player. So as a player, he's transitioned into now an SNC sports scientist. Uh, and he's got some really good insights. Um, you can imagine that you could learn from an ex-player that's now in this field of developing players and physical preparation. It's it's he's got some really good insights um, on how to set things up, how, how to make things uh, more enjoyable for the players. Seeing as he was one at the top level for quite a while, um, and then I think outside of the clubs, um, I've got a couple of other really good mentors. I would say uh, one of them, Sean Potter. A uh, good friend of mine, we worked in the same gym in Coburg for a while. Um, he's, yeah, he's a top-notch coach, top-notch person, um, and he's always he's always there to help me. Um, whenever I've got questions or whenever we're discussing certain issues, he's he's one of the main main men I go to. Um, and then probably another, another one would be, or another two, I'd say. These are the other two that would probably I chat to the most in terms of just general stuff in the industry and, and um, coaching and, um, discussions and whatnot uh, would be John Cobiella, um, who's a, a soccer-based SNC coach, who's sort of done a bit of stuff in in the A League in the past, um, and Claudio Altieri as well, um, who's sort of doing lots of stuff in soccer, um, very much based with uh, international teams or um, teams overseas. So yeah, both got really good insights that uh, I can sort of start to to take. Um, and learn from their experiences, uh, I guess, because uh, 
for me, I can't get that experience hands on and firsthand. So if I can sort of gather that from from these sorts of guys, then yeah, that can that can help me definitely in the future. Mm -hmm. And and you touched on the importance of putting yourself out there to gain these experiences. How do you um, go about building your network uh, and and finding out about these um, people that are in clubs? Um, perhaps in it, you know, if there's a a club that you want to work in, how, or how do you think the best way is to build those connections? Is it um, through people that you already know in your network? Is it LinkedIn, uh, Twitter? Talk us through your your favorite way to reach new networks. Yeah, I think for me it would be um, you're definitely talking to people you know first, um, people who might have a, a connection with someone uh, in a club or in a, in a position that. Um, you find interesting or you want to talk to that person. So definitely start with people that you already know. So being, uh, you know, in a sport and exercise science degree, you're going to come across um, lots of people. They're involved in sports. They're, they're involved in sports because of their other connections that might be involved in sports. So um, I'll start with the people that you sort of, you meet firsthand. Um, and then definitely if there are people that you resonate with online, um, they're putting out really good content or they're sharing things that you sort of, you tend to always agree with or, um, they're sharing things that maybe you don't agree with. They're, they're always sort of challenging to your thought process. Then I guess they're the, they're the types of people you want to reach out to. Um, and I guess, yeah, if you can't, you know, meet in person, uh, potentially set up a call with them um, just to talk shop, just to learn, just to understand their viewpoints. Because, um, yeah, you can get, definitely get a lot from a conversation um, uh, with someone in that, I guess, in that space that you're sort of looking up to. Can get a lot out of that um just as much as probably what you might do if you you know visit a club for a day um and i guess i guess that's the the difference is when you do go and visit a club even if it is just for a day uh, you find that the people that um, may have invited you or have allowed you to come through they're actually quite busy they're actually hands-on doing a lot of stuff so they might not have time to explain the ins and outs of what they're doing to you um, so maybe getting them on a call might be a better option because they can sort of dive into a bit more detail about stuff that you might have seen or have questions about. Um, but, yeah, they're probably the main things. Yeah. Yep. And going back to your career, mate, there's some highlights that spring front of mind that you're you know, proud of that you've been able to achieve so far or, or perhaps stories that you're yeah, happy enough to, to be a part of? Um, yeah, for sure. I think um, for me, you always remember winning silverware. So... Uh, although that's not the be all and end all of the job, and it's definitely not, um, you, you're just one piece in the in the in the puzzle, so to speak. Like it's definitely a nice feeling to to, I guess, experience that. So my first ever season as an SNC coach at uh, Saint Albans Saints in the MPL two, um, they had been sort of floating around mid table for a few years, and then um, all of a sudden we'd we'd gone in and, and won the league um, that very first season. So that was definitely special. So that was a a title and a promotion in the same year. Um, and then a highlight for me was actually getting to work in that MPL level, that um, top tier in the state level for soccer um, with the same club the next year. Um, that club was also, they're a strong um, Croatian club. They've got a Croatian background and they also hosted uh, Croatian tournaments or national tournaments with all the other Croatian clubs around the, the country. So that year um, was pretty cool because we'd won the title, but we'd also won both of the national tournaments out of all the Croatian clubs that year as well. So Definitely some yeah. some pretty um pretty fond memories from back then, um, and I think as well uh, the next one would be just being a part of um, of Western United as well. I guess uh, their academy team that I'm working with now started in the MPL three, um, which would be considered uh, I guess the third tier in the state. Mm -hmm. um, started in MPL three uh, and basically uh, the first season that they competed was sort of a, a cancelled season due to COVID. But the next season when I was there um, was really exciting because we'd, we'd actually secured promotion that season as well. So didn't quite get to the to the top of the, the ladder this time, but was able we were definitely able to to get the job done in a playoff match and get promoted to MPL2. So that was a big one. And then although I wasn't directly working with the A-League men's squad at the time, when the um when the A-League men's squad won the, the A-League grand final in their third ever season, um, yeah, definitely involved in the celebrations and the parties. So that's something that I'll that I'll never forget either. Yeah, it's an amazing achievement from a club that in three years to take out the a professional league. Um, yeah, it must be it must uh, have some great people involved um, to get that amount of momentum early on. 
Uh, what have you learned from um, working at the club about, you know, I guess success leaves clues. So what have you learned in those successful clubs um, that you've been a part of? Um, is there common trends um, from, from different leagues that you see to win that ultimate silverware? I think, I think for me, the thing that I've seen um, that really sort of sticks with me now is that you have to have everyone on the same page. Um, so communication is obviously crucial. We talk about it all the time about being on the same page and what that looks like, but it, I find that it's actually quite, quite hard to achieve. So um, it needs to be, it needs to be from everyone. So not only the head coach, the assistant coaches or the S and C uh, this, it includes the medical and the people behind the scenes and whoever else is involved with the club that they all share the same ideas and vision about where the club's going and how, uh, how the club should be viewed by, from the outside in by other people. Um, and I think mm -hmm. if you can get that, if you can get that right um, and sort of push, um, really push what you're trying to do as an SNC or a high performance coach within that program and sort of set the standards of, of like a hard working culture um, and, a, and, a, and a sort of culture of always looking to improve and develop as opposed to sort of being sort of content with where you're at. Um, then I think, yeah, if, if you're really driving improvement and development, then you can start to see some, some pretty good cool things happen for sure. Yep. Yeah, and you mentioned challenges, um, you know, to maintain everyone not being on the same page. Uh, what do you think it it takes um, for, yeah, for a cohort of of, of people working in different um, areas of the club to be able to stay on the same page? Is that a leadership thing? Uh, you mentioned communication. Yeah, what do you what do you think are some key qualities for for players and staff to be able to stay on the same page and live the same values? Well, I think it definitely starts from the coach. Um, if you have the right head coach um, and all of their sort of um, recruiting, recruitments and signings after that are going to be in line with what the head coach is looking for. So if the head coach has the freedom to sort of um, decide on, I guess, the right people to bring in mm -hmm. um, and those people can sort of really buy into what the, the head coach is driving, uh, it's, it's going to be a lot easier for everyone to be on the same page from day one. Um, as opposed to sort of having a, a staff chop and change, um, people coming in, people leaving, things changing, things changing um, all the time can be a little bit tricky. But I think that consistency of coaching staff and, and the message that you're sending um, is is one of the keys, definitely, to to get that across. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to your career, mate, what have been some significant challenges that you've faced uh, working in professional sport? I imagine there's been a few. Uh, and, and yeah, what have you learned or how have you grown from it as a practitioner? I think in um, in that COVID year, especially um, when we're sort of in and out of lockdown about three or four times here in Melbourne, uh, that was a big challenge for me. I think definitely trying to uh, still try and give the players what they needed in terms of S&C, uh, but not sort of uh, taken away from them trying to get some type of um, I guess some type of a, a escape from all the negativity associated with the lockdown. <coughs> I think that that was definitely a challenge of trying to get the balance right between how much and what type of training they should be doing in those one, two, three week lockdowns. Um, and then getting them um, to sort of also find ways to sort of uh, get their mind off things as well, because it was a challenging time. A lot of the players were sort of out of work, um, weren't able to work during the time. Um, so that was a challenge that I guess more and more people were facing was that they didn't sort of know what to do with their time when they weren't allowed to leave the home and they weren't allowed to work. So um, trying to find other fun ways to, to engage the players while also getting them to still work hard so that they could be ready when we were to return to sport, that was definitely a big challenge. But I think um, another really valuable experience was working in the with West United in their first ever season as a startup club. Um, I think it's it's incredible how much work goes in behind the scenes and how much extra hours everyone puts in to make to make a club work to make especially a brand new club um, the amount of uh, attention to detail, the amount of hours, the amount of everything that goes on um, that not just the S&C and the medical departments are doing, but everyone um, that was part of the club 
was doing. Um, that's definitely a lesson that it, it just goes to show that if everyone can sort of dig deep and work hard and have this vision or this goal in mind, you can definitely achieve some some pretty amazing things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it takes significant amount of work for you know, bringing in a new staff member into a team, let alone everyone being on, uh, new to, to the environment. So I can only imagine the amount of work that would have been going into that and, and I imagine learning from everyone. Um, but but clearly what was done uh, worked as it was pretty quick success. Uh, going into the key topic, mate, in terms of physical long-term and physical development, uh, clearly it's a big part of your role. But for, for the role that you're in, um, for those that aren't aware, what would be some of your key focuses or big rocks, if you like, from a daily point of view or even maybe from a weekly point of view? Yep. So um, the age group that I'm working with at the moment is under 23s and under 21s. So... Um, if you look at sort of the, the LTAD sort of frameworks and and all that sort of thing, basically these guys are mostly 17 and over. So when you're looking at that sort of age group, they're sort of looking more towards the the more developed um, the more developed side of the juniors um, or elite youth athletes. So they've sort of gone through their peak height velocity, they've they've gone through puberty, they've started to develop some some muscle mass. Um, and basically, they're at a point where they can actually be pretty safely loaded in a variety of different stimulus. So um, for me, the big rocks um, is making sure that they're hitting their, their strength sessions every week. Um, we have two strength sessions a week for these guys. Um, we have more in preseason um, where we can sort of take take back a little bit of their training loads on the field in the, pre in the, in the off season and the preseason and sort of do a bit more gym-based stuff to set them up um, for a bit more of a maintenance style program in season. Um, that's definitely better focus with this age group. Um, and then I think the other stuff that's really important is that you, you, you're making sure that you're, um, you're hitting all aspects of your conditioning and your speed work as well. Um, so, you know, whether it's a weekly speed session or, you know, um, weekly sprints or they have a, a top up set of um, conditioning that they might have to do based on, you know, turnaround times um, between fixtures. Um, definitely make sure we're incorporating that. And then one that I definitely always like to keep in the program is plyometrics as well. So um, most of the plyometric stuff we'll do is on field um, and we'll use that as part of their, we have like a little ADP or athlete development sort of um, program section that we sort of include at the start of sessions. And um, they'll definitely touch on plyos, plyometrics a couple of times a week, um, as well as all those other sort of uh, qualities that I was mentioning. Yeah. And, and when you're new to a, a club, what, what are some of your most effective ways or, or I guess advice for SNCs going into a development role to um, gain buy-in uh, from the athletes so your program can be yeah most effective? I think, um, I think it might depend on the sport as well. But if you're working in soccer, for me, a big thing that um, players really enjoy and coaches actually are quite fond of it as well is that you're, you're able to sort of um, – include more football specific stuff within whatever development stuff that you're doing so whether that's including a, a passing drill a passing component or a dribbling component or something with the ball um, just to show that you're getting a little bit more technical aspect of um, of the sport involved in what you're doing as well so it's not just all about um, i guess snc uh, i think that could be really helpful to get guys on board in terms of buying into the program or what you're doing because if, even if you're just drip feeding a couple of drills that have the ball involved um, throughout the week, then your other sessions, you could say, all right, well, we're not using the ball today, but we're going to focus really heavily on this um, on this component today, which is, you know, something that I might deem as really important for the program, but the, the other coaches, the technical coaches might not. So so having a little bit of a blend of those two can definitely help with your buy-in. Yeah. Yep. And what about uh, like each role will have its set of challenges uh, what are some yeah key challenges that you think are pretty common no matter what um uh of the person that's in in a role or, or sport i guess in a, in a development role um and what are some solutions for those challenges from an snc point of view yeah so i think a lot of a lot of people who might be in a, in a junior setup um the the biggest i guess barrier or hurdle they're going to have is that they might not might not have access to a gym or to a weight room or um, to anything where they can sort of load the players up in terms of strength. So so being 
resourceful and being creative in ways that you can um, load these guys up is going to be really important for your development. Uh, and I think it's definitely possible because if you're going to be working with junior players, um, you know, sort of 17 and under, uh, there's definitely value in in utilizing, you know, body weight strength methods or um, lighter load strength training or technical based um, movement efficiency type um, training, uh, bands, uh, all sorts of stuff that you can use and implement into a program to actually get a, a really good stimulus for, for these younger guys as well. Yeah, well said, mate. And that when following those body weight programs, um, at, at what would have been some uh, effective resources that you found to be able to, I guess, um, follow from a soccer or, or, or even in the VFL perspective? In terms of the body weight, um, I think, yeah, I think you need to know how to obviously regress an exercise and adjust it to, to fit the person. Um, I guess if, you, if you're getting a, a squad full of, I guess, 13-year-olds that have never been into the gym before, they don't really have an understanding of what strength conditioning is or, or movements in the gym might be, like the core movements that you might do, you need to know how to, say, um, adjust what a pull-up is or a push-up is or um, give them... I guess something to help them with their squat technique if they're not able to squat with their their heels down on the ground or, or something like that um yep. just being able to to regress and progress exercises um when needed can definitely be um, really helpful and like you mentioned you're involved in the um a league men's team when you're on the gym floor compared to being with the under 23s what are some differences that you see from a physical preparation point of view for academy players uh compared to professionals i think the main difference is that the the pros have just got a few more years of training under the belt so they're going to be stronger they're going to be more powerful they're going to be quicker um so for us it's all it's all the same stuff really with this set especially the 17 plus age group that i'm sort of working with mainly um they're at a point now where they can start to really develop sort of their strength and power qualities um in the gym and mm -hmm their speed and their change of direction and their anaerobic and aerobic capacities on the pitch. So um, the stuff that they do is actually quite similar. I would just say that the the level the level that they're at in terms of training age um, is is the differentiation between those guys. So we're striving to to get these guys to to be um, to be essentially doing what the A-League guys are doing because um, they could get if they, they perform really well um, and they're a standout for us this season, they could be offered a scholarship contract at the end of the season to, to join the A-League squad. So um, we want to make sure that the, our players are going to be ready to just step in to an A-League environment and be able to, to cope with the training that they're doing as well. And after seeing that um, process where you've got the under 23, that 17 to 23 year old, um, do you think there's a place for it in Australian rules football? Uh, obviously, you've worked in the VFL where basically there's NAB League and then uh, if you don't get drafted, you, you play State League. Do you think there's a place for yeah, an under-23 league in Australian rules football? And, and if so, what are some of the benefits? It's a good question. Um, I don't know how it would work. I think I think there's definitely – there could be some benefits to it for sure. Um I know there's there's you know there's the next gen academies for some clubs that have sort of younger age groups coming all the way up, um, but I think I think the the beauty of it of the VFL is that you know these guys that might be first year or, or sort of not breaking into the to the AFL squads, um, they get to play in the VFL against against men against um, really really good quality athletes. Um, and that's where most of the development is going to occur. So I think the setup is is almost quite similar in the sense that um, our academy boys will play against uh, senior men's teams as well. So we're playing against senior men's teams in the MPL2 at the moment, um, which would be essentially be the division below the VFL. Um, yeah. So still playing against senior men, but obviously with a much younger squad. So I think our average age is about uh, 20 for the under 23s. And I think it might be... 17 or 18 for the under 21 so they're much younger than um, the age group allows but the fact that they get to play against um, senior opposition is is really crucial for their development mm -hmm. yeah and do you have much to do with the parents uh, of the squad that you're looking after or, or is that something that someone else in a different role sort of manages um yeah there's there's a little bit of contact uh with the parents i think mainly uh most information that I'm sending out to the guys will, will be sent directly to players. So whether that's in terms of recovery or nutrition type stuff, um, that'll go straight to the players. But then 
we definitely have a focus on education. So uh, a lot of these players obviously have never been in, in an elite academy environment before. So they, they don't have an understanding about some of the concepts around um, training, nutrition, recovery, sleep, hydration, all these sorts of things. So we're starting to put together education sessions for players and parents um, so they could both be a part of that process um, so that players and parents can help players to make a bit more uh, informed decisions about what they should be doing in terms of um, all those all those concepts that I was just talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, mate. Isn't it? Have you found that there's, a, um, in terms of getting the parents on board, uh, is it a matter of... Um, I imagine there's a balancing act if you want the athletes to drive it and you want the parents supporting it. But what, what have you seen uh, in your experience is a successful sort of uh, balance between the parent and, and the athlete uh, in driving um, this this process, I guess, in, in, and how do you sort of encourage the athlete over time to yeah start to take more ownership? Yeah, I think, I think especially with... Uh, the age group that I'm working with, it, it definitely comes a lot from the players themselves. So they're at an age now where they're sort of, you know, last couple of years of high school, maybe starting uni. Um, they're definitely at a point where a lot of their decisions are their own and they're starting to to make better choices about, um, you know, what they're doing outside of training as well. Um, and a lot of the questions will come directly from the players too. So I think, yeah, I think mostly with the older age group, um, that I'm working with that yeah it's definitely self-driven from the players um, and the parents will help support that where they can um, but for the younger age groups I haven't had as much experience chatting with parents of younger age groups um, regarding that sort of thing but I would yep. say in my experience I guess in like the private setting when I'm working with um, younger players um, it's definitely it's definitely a lot of conversations um, with parents about uh, I think the main thing is younger younger sort of athletes um that are getting told certain things by their parents they don't sort of want to listen or they don't, they don't yeah, think yeah. that their parents know what they're talking about so sometimes yep. it's just a matter of all right um what is the main message you're trying to get across as a parent how can i help facilitate that message and also just give a bit more information um about that topic um based on my own experiences and knowledges and knowledge um, so that i can help that younger athlete um, so yeah, discussing with the parents and then trying to just relate with with the younger athlete um, and put things across in in more simple terms or more relatable terms for them to understand and and um, I guess absorb that information is definitely something you try to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, mate. And uh, moving to the next section in terms of common mistakes um, that you've seen or experienced yourself, uh, or perhaps S and C coaches you think could be making. Um, we're all about making mistakes. That's the best way to learn and grow. But what do you think is some common ones that perhaps uh, S&Cs could listen to this podcast and uh, prevent from uh, hearing from your advice? And, and what are some common solutions to try and prevent making those mistakes with uh, academy programs? Um, I think for younger athletes, uh, especially ones that are sort of seemingly pretty well developed physically already, um, it's important not to go not to go too crazy with those guys. Um, the, I guess the rate of maturation and things like that and, you know, players in different age groups and different um, sort of growing at different rates that, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to see all sorts of different issues that come up with, um, with, with youth athletes um, playing sport and the, and the medical issues that might be involved with that. Um, so lots of overuse injuries, lots of, um, shin splints and Osgood slatters and, and all sorts of hip um, issues going on. I think the best thing is to make sure that you get them um, to get them training really consistently first. Uh, so they're not just really ad hoc when they when they are doing their gym based training. So they're not just coming in, you know, one session this week and then oh, I've missed out. I had to go to training the next week, um, club training. Then I, I didn't do a gym session for three weeks. Now I'm back in, but I want to I want to continue doing exactly what I was doing before I left off. So it's just being a little bit smarter about getting that message across to be a bit more consistent with your training and that um, you don't have to go really hard all the time. Just get the get the consistency of the movement patterns in, um, make it a habit, make it really repeatable and simple and easy to follow. Um, and then you can start to layer in, especially when they start to really um, sort of mature and start to grow. And you can definitely tell that they've, they're out of their, their sort of peak high velocity stage and they're 
and they're sort of maturing through puberty, then that's when you can start to say, all right, this athlete is a bit more comfortable with their, you know, the coordination with their changing limb lengths and changing body types that now we can start to see that the technique's been really good for quite a while. We could start to load them up a little bit more heavy now. Mm. Yeah, some gems there that hopefully the notebooks came out, mate, and thanks for, thank you for sharing. Uh, you, you also manage a gym. Uh, can you talk us through your motivation to open up a gym uh, and how you balance uh, working in elite sport and also the private sector? Yeah, so I've got a gym based out in Brunswick. It's called Rebuild Health and Performance. It's actually a, a rehab or a physio clinic as well. So um, that started just after COVID. Um, and basically, I, I just finished up with um, with Western United that first season that I was there. And I'd done a season with Brunswick City in the NPL. Um, and that season got cancelled due to COVID. And then basically, yeah, I just hadn't done anything club-based for a little while. And then my business partner and I had been talking for years about opening up something that um, we could sort of run and do our own way. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a physio as well. So um, for us, we were constantly referring clients to each other, um, which is another, I guess, another thing that's really important in our, in our lines of work is that you need to have good network of specialist coaches or physios or whoever else around you that you can, when you don't have the um, ability to, to service that person, you can send them to the right people. Um, so he was someone that I was constantly sending people to and vice versa when he would um, he would see athletes that had previous injuries that would sort of um, get on top of their niggles and stuff. He would say, look, it's probably a really good idea for you now to get into some consistent strength conditioning. So he would send it to me. Um, but yeah, we've decided to open that, that business um, to basically, yeah, keep that relationship going and try to, to double down on sort of what we're doing in our separate practices and bring it all under one roof and, and try and... Um, really give the the full sort of um, service to, to our athletes. Yeah. And for those that haven't worked in the private sector or, or developed their own business, uh, is there some crossover in working in as a practitioner in sport? And, and if so, what are some of the benefits? Um, yeah, definitely. I think there's some huge differences between private sector S&C and, and club-based S&C. Um, for example, when you're sort of working with guys in, in the private sector, you don't have a really clear understanding of what they're doing in training um, on the pitch. So it's it can get really difficult sometimes, especially when you're trying to have that conversation with these athletes about um, certain topics that uh, they sort of make sense to you as, as someone who's been in the industry for a while and you're trying to find out what, what are your themes of training? What, what do you do on each night when you're at the club? You know, do you do speed stuff on this night? Do you do conditioning on this night? What does it sort of look like? And a lot of the time, depending on the level of sport, there's there's no structure to what they're doing. So it's really hard to know how to place certain things in someone's program. Um, for example, if you're trying to get some, some eccentric hamstring work in because it's something that this athlete really needs, but you're not sure if they've got sprinting components uh, at their club training, it can be really a tricky situation um, to try and program effectively for those people. Uh, but I think the crossover, yeah, of of being being in a club setting um, definitely helps with how you program your gym based stuff outside of um, outside of their club based training because you sort of have a better understanding of what they might be doing on each night um, and especially in terms of um, returning to play rehab space um, you've got a better understanding of what they can and can't do when they're returning to the club so for example someone coming back from a from a strain. Uh, just a, let's just say it's a hamstring strain, they might be um, ready to return to training, but you don't want to throw them straight back into the deep end straight away without sort of understanding that they can tolerate the loads that they're, that they're being given at training. So you might, I guess, as someone who's been working in a club, you might then say to them, all right, I think it's a good idea for you to do partial training at the club this week. I want you to go to training, but I want you to do, you know, the warm up. I want you to do um, the passing practice that they might be doing, um, get involved in some of the small small games, but as soon as there's some transition-based drills or um, big match simulation drills where there's going to be lots of sprinting, that's when you come out and you do your specific runs instead. Mm -hmm. um, so we might give them some some distances and speeds to hit um, instead of joining into that drill and doing that drill with that sort of chaotic nature um, that might push them to a level that they're not quite ready, um, ready for just yet. So yeah, definitely that return to play, being in a club has, has helped with being able to return to play these these guys that are in rehab yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense 
and, and moving over to the last part of the show, mate, the personal side, um, do you have pet peeves, anything that fires you up in the industry or uh, with working with athletes in your work life? Pet peeves. Um, I think uh, pet peeve for me in, in the private sector is um, last-minute cancellations. That's that's a killer yeah. um, for yeah. any coach. I know most of you guys can relate to that. So it is definitely a pet peeve. But I think um, in terms of athletes, the biggest pet peeve would be when um, when you when you rock up into the gym and you know the program's set and you're ready to start, and they decide to start doing whatever they want instead of the program for that day. Um, yeah. and you have to go, what's going on? What are you doing? What, what's all this about? And they decide to go on this tangent about, um, uh, which athlete they saw doing this on Instagram. So they decided that their program is now going to be this instead of the, uh, the club S and C program. So that's, that's definitely a pet peeve. <laughs> the joys and of today's technology. Hey, everyone thinks they're an S and C. Um, <laughs> what, what's your favorite way to uh, spend a day off? Uh, I had the morning off today, actually, so um, got up, went for a run, um, and just had a nice breakfast. And I think, yeah, just chilled out, to be honest. So I don't get a lot of free time. So when I do, I try not to do too much, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely spending time with um, friends and family. Um, and if I get a chance to this year, hopefully there's not too many clashes in my in my working sort of schedule that I can go and watch a few games, um, games of footy as well. I'll go watch Essendon. I'm a big fan. So hopefully we can... Do something a little bit better this year. Yeah, yeah, good start for the Dons round one. So there's a bit of momentum there. Uh, well, yeah, thank we'll you for coming it. on, mate, and, and uh, sharing with us your, your experiences in in athlete development, both across VFL as well as uh, the A League uh, and the Academy program. Um, you've got a fair few things going on for 2023, including managing your own gym as well as working in sport. What what are you most excited about uh, for, or what's on the horizon? I guess for the rest of the year for you. Yeah, I think for me, um, there's a few things that I want to start to to build out in terms of um, in terms of services and offerings at Rebuild. So um, I'm working a little bit behind the scenes, and it's about sort of starting to um, get a bit of a, a mentor slash internship program um, going. So I just want to make sure that that's all that's all exactly how I want it before I start to sort of get that thing going. Um, and then, yeah, for, I guess in terms of the club stuff, yeah, just keep keep going with the academy. Um, hopefully, the boys can do do well this year. Now, and my goal for them is that some of them can can get some contracts at the end of the year, regardless of, of sort of where the team finishes at the end of the season. Yep. And uh, a listener has just sent through in a question for you, mate, and uh, it is from Gualam. Is it elite athlete body uh, or a mindset which is important? So. I guess it's um yeah is it more the physical side that you focus on in your role or or the psychological side i think there's a pretty big crossover to be honest um you'll find that yeah certain depending on the drills or the exercise that you're doing um some can be uh, a little bit more physical sort of focused because you're trying to 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 i guess get a stimulus and an ad adaptation from that exercise but then there are some things that you will do that um they're their reasoning for that, for doing those exercises is a little bit more of a mental thing. So um, understanding that you can you can sort of do things that you thought previously were not possible. Um, so just, I guess, giving athletes that, that frame of reference about what they actually can push to um, is, is definitely a really important part of trying to develop performance and, and get to that next level for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, mate. And yeah, thank you again for coming on. For, for anyone that wants to uh, send through some follow-up questions or, or get in contact, mate, um, and, and perhaps work with you as well for any of the parents listening in or, or developing athletes and work at um, Rebuild with you, uh, where's the best place to get in contact? Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty pretty active on um, Instagram, um, at sportsci underscore Lewis is where you could find me there. Otherwise, um, yeah, any sort of contact um through rebuild there's a um, rebuild health and performance.com.au you can contact us through there we'll, we'll be all across any communication through there as well for sure perfect and yeah for those listening in that might be driving listening to podcasts we'll add those links in the show notes 
Um, but yeah, thank you for everyone that's tuned in uh, to this week's episode. We will publish it next Wednesday. So if you tuned in halfway through for the, from now till next Wednesday, you can watch this on our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you do. Lewis has uh, dropped gems all the way throughout, whether you're a strength conditioning coach or for developing athletes. And uh, our next live chat is with Rhett Larson, who's also a strength conditioning coach, and uh, he'll be discussing and presenting on how to add fun to a high-performance environment. So that'll be next Wednesday, the 29th at 1 o'clock. So I'll see you guys then. Thanks again, Lewis.